والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Hajj Step by Step. Perhaps this is finally your year to perform Hajj and you need a guide to this whole process and inshallah this show will be for you. Of course maybe you feel overwhelmed by the idea of Hajj and have tried to put it off. So inshallah this program can help you feel a little more at ease with all of the rights at Hajj. Or maybe you've never even thought about Hajj, never even considered it a possibility. And inshallah, this program will give you the motivation. Of course, for those of you who have already been on Hajj, this is a chance to uh, relive all those wonderful memories and maybe plan for another Hajj in the future. I'm your host, Musa McGuire, and without any further delay, I'd like to introduce our guide to the rights of Hajj on this program, Sheikh Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I don't want to delay any further before we get into the real issue here. But before we ta start talking about the actual rights of Hajj, can you tell us a little bit about the history of Hajj? Where does this, this uh, act of worship come from? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful. Praise be to Allah, we praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is a truly a guided one. And whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can show Him guidance. We bear witness that there is no God who is worthy of worship but Allah, and we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last messenger. Actually in the Quran there is a whole surah which is named after this great act of worship, Al-Hajj, Surah Al-Hajj. Uh, a few verses in the surah explain in details the history of Hajj. It begins when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the surah, وَإِذْ بَوَّأْنَا لِإِبْرَاهِيمَ مَكَانَ الْبَيْتِ أَلَّا تُشْرِكْ بِي شَيْئًا وَطَهِّرْ بَيْتِيَ لِلطَّائِفِينَ وَالْقَائِمِينَ وَالرُّكَّعِ السُّجُودِ وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ The meaning of these two verses of Surah Al-Hajj and remember when we showed Abraham, Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, the appointed site of the house, Al-Kaaba, saying, لا تشرك بي شيئا Associate none with me in worship. And commanding him to sanctify the house of Allah on earth and make it ready for الطائفين, those who perform tawaf, والقائمين, and those who are standing in prayer, والركع السجود, and those who bow down and prostrate themselves in the salah. Then, وَأَذِّمْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ And proclaim to mankind the hajj. They shall come to you on foot and on every lean camel, from every deep distant mountain highway, to perform this great act of worship, to visit the ancient house Al Kaaba. Actually, uh, when this command was laid upon Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said, Oh Allah, I'm just a human being. My voice cannot reach all mankind. It cannot reach everywhere. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed him, Ya Ibrahim, 
Your duty is to proclaim and to call upon mankind to perform Hajj. And our job is to deliver. So basically, it was the call of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. And there, everybody is answering this call. Every believer is dreaming of performing this journey to go to visit the ancient house, Al-Kaaba, perform Hajj and Umrah. And that will continue to take place until the Day of Judgment. And isn't it true that the, the, the Kaaba, which we, of course, visit on Hajj, is, is the oldest house of worship on the planet? It is, according to... Another verse in Surah Ali Imran, Allah the Almighty says, Verily, the very first house of worship was appointed for mankind on earth is Al Kaaba, which is at Bakka. That's another name to Mecca. Uh, full of blessings and guidance for mankind and Al-Jannah as well. Well, Sheikh, let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the virtues of performing Hajj. I mean, we know that this is uh, uh, one of the greatest acts of worship that we can perform as Muslims, but what specifically are, are the benefits of Hajj? Of course, once we start talking about the virtues and the benefits of performing Hajj and Umrah, that will motivate every believer to save up and to try their utmost to perform Hajj, simply because there are great rewards saved for those who perform Hajj and Umrah. And we're not only talking about the mandatory act of Hajj or Umrah, we're talking about performing Hajj and Umrah even voluntarily, so many times, uh, if one is able to do so. Uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated in the sound hadith, which is collected by Imam al-Tirmidhi, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, تَابِعُوا بَيْنَ الْحَجِّ وَالْعُمْرَةِ Follow up on the performance of Hajj and Umrah. فَإِنَّهُمَا يَنْفِيَانِ الْفَقْرَ وَالْذُنُوبِ Since, indeed, performing Hajj and Umrah overcome poverty and remove sins exactly as fire remove and separate germ from iron, gold, and silver. Furthermore, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated that وَالْحَجُّ الْمَبْرُورُ لَيْسَ لَهُ جَزَاءٌ إِلَّا الْجَنَّةِ And Al-Hajj, which is Mabrur, the accepted Hajj, its earlier word is paradise. In another hadith, uh, it's a sound hadith, which is narrated by Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, الْعُمْرَةُ إِلَى الْعُمْرَةِ كَفَّارَةُ لِمَا بَيْنَهُمَا Performing Umrah after another Umrah are sure to gain forgiveness for whatever sins were, com were committed in between. Also he stated, وَالْحَجُّ الْمَبْرُورُ لَيْسَ لَهُ جَزَاءٌ إِلَّا الْجَنَّةِ And the earlier word for the accepted Hajj is Al-Jannah, is Paradise. Let me ask you, Shaykh, when, uh, of course, all the work that goes into performing Hajj and Umrah, um, we desperately hope uh, and, and ask Allah that He will accept it. But how can we know that, that Hajj is accepted? Because uh, this, obviously, as you mentioned, is a condition for the, the, the great reward, the greatest reward of paradise. This is actually a very smart question. Since there are several hadith indicated that Al Hajj al Mabrur. Its earlier word is paradise, and the scholars uh, explain al mabrur as accepted. So, how can one uh, make certain that his or her hajj has been accepted? Uh, in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ explains. He says, Peace be upon him, Man hajja falam yarfuth wa lam yafsuq, raj'aka yawmi waladatu ummu. One who performs hajj and does not approach his wife sexually nor does he commit sins or speak obscene language and he controls his anger during this journey, once he's done, he would go back as the same day he was born, meaning sinless. If a person, after performing the, uh, this great act of worship, Hajj or Umrah, and they go back and they not changes that took place in their life, they have adopted better manners, they have given up on sins that they used to commit. That's a very great sign that their hajj did really change their life 
and that's a sign that the Hajj has been accepted. Uh, Sheikh, there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding, of course, about the term in Islam, uh, jihad. Um, a lot of misinterpretations and mistranslations, um, and certainly a lot of bad press surrounding this word. Uh, but of course, the word, as we know, means means struggle, and 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 relates to really a wide variety of of uh, processes and struggles that a Muslim goes through in life. Isn't it true that Hajj uh, can be considered a kind of struggle in this manner? Actually, you're so right. Hajj is jihad. Uh, if you get to see a picture of people performing tawaf, turning around the Kaaba in a magnificent manner. Uh, going for Arafat, spending the night at Al Muzdalifah, throwing the stones, it is a struggle. The journey itself is very, very tiring. However, people are inspired, big deal, great deal, to perform Hajj and Umrah. According to hadith narrated by Aisha, the mother of the believers, may Allah be pleased with her, she said that uh, once she asked the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O oh, Prophet of Allah, did Allah ordain Hajj upon women? He said, Yes. Yes, you too have to observe jihad. The jihad for you is to observe Hajj, where there is no fighting. Rather, it is only performing this faridah or this act of worship and struggling in performing the ceremonies of Hajj and Umrah exactly as they were prescribed. Well, Sheikh, it's very nice to hear that a wonderful reminder, and it's a very powerful point. But I want to shift to some of the actual uh, rulings on Hajj. And first, for whom is, is Hajj obligatory? What, what are the conditions? Of course, we all want to perform it. But what are the conditions where it becomes obligatory upon us to perform it? Well, uh, first of all, the Quran stated that Hajj is a mandatory act of worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Ali Imran, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا So it is mandatory but with conditions. So let us learn uh, the preconditions of the performance of Hajj and Umrah. Sheikh, I don't want to uh, cut you off, but let's leave it as a bit of a cliffhanger until we come back from a short break. And when we do, we'll talk more about these conditions uh, on the obligation of Hajj. So please stay tuned and we'll be back in just a bit. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Hajj Step by Step. Before the break, Sheikh, we were talking about the conditions that make the Hajj mandatory. I had to cut you off, so go ahead with these conditions. Well, we stated a verse of Surah Ali Imran that says that uh, Hajj to the house, to the ancient house, is a duty that uh, people owe to Allah the Almighty. And then he put a condition, those who can afford the journey. Uh, the ulama concluded the, the, the conditions of uh, the performance of Hajj and Umrah from both the Quran and the Sunnah as follows. That a person has to be a Muslim to have his Hajj or Umrah accepted. Has to be mature enough. We're going to talk about them collectively, then explain each condition in details. Uh, to be capable, and the capability is both financial and physical and uh, to be safe, to feel safe in the performance of the journey, uh, security. And finally, for a woman, she has to have a male mahram with her. Uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, and his father narrated that in a sound hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Bunya al-Islamu ala khams, and this is a very, very famous hadith that uh, every Muslim must know that Islam is built and based on five pillars. Islam is a building, uh, its construction is built on five pillars. Uh, the first one is shahadati an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammad rasulullah. The second is iqamati salah 
performing the five daily prayers. The third is paying uh, the zakah. The fourth is performing hajj. And the fifth is fasting during the month of Ramadan. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ stated that hajj liman istata'a ilayhi sabila. For a person who can afford the journey. Uh, a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ from the tribe of Khatham and she said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, the mandatory act of hajj has cut up my father uh, while he's an ill person. He cannot sit still on the back of his ride. Uh, can I perform hajj on his estate? So the Prophet ﷺ said, sure, you can perform hajj on his estate. We understand from this hadith that concerning the capability, her father was not capable physically, but they were capable financially. So in this case, they had uh, to perform hajj on his behalf, his daughter at least, of course, in the presence of her mahram. So the ulama explained the, the, the issue or the condition of the capability. It's not mandatory on every Muslim, but only those who can afford the journey. Financially, that they have the means of spending uh, uh, the cost of the journey, of going back and forth and staying there for uh, so long enough to perform Al-Hajj Wal-Umrah. Let me ask you something about this, Sheikh, because I know some people are panicking right now. Um, what exactly qualifies as being financially capable? For instance, some people might own a car or own a house, um, and, and the value of those items would be enough that if they sold them, they could go on Hajj. Does this count as, as the financial capability, or does it, does it mean excess money? How do, we, how do we gauge it? We're talking about uh, uh, extra money saving that is enough and sufficient for the whole journey. Not only that, and to leave behind too for the family members and those who are under your guardianship, enough to suffice them while you're away. But to sell your car, or sell your house or property just to perform hajj while there is a, a, a necessity for all what you have, it's not recommended, it's not prescribed at all. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala لا يكلف نفسا إلا وسعها does not lay any command on any soul beyond its capacity. This is as far as the financial uh, capability. And that's why the scholars concluded that uh, a person should not borrow money to perform hajj. If you don't have, you don't have to go. Some people do not go to perform hajj because they don't have the financial means, but their souls are performing hajj. They would love to perform a hajj, but if they would have the means. What about a situation a little bit different where maybe you have an extra money, but you really want some luxury item. Maybe you already have a, a car that suffices your family, but you know, you're having a midlife crisis and you want to get a sports car or something. In this case, if you haven't performed hajj, should you give preference to the hajj over that extra luxury item? Uh, definitely, because... You never know if you would live until next year when you have enough or not. Uh, since the Prophet ﷺ warned a person who have the means and financially capable, don't you postpone it for no reason. Because you never know if you would live the next year or not. Even if you live, would you still have the means? Would you still have the health, the capability to perform hajj or not? Keep in mind, Brother Musa, that uh, look around. Only a couple of million Muslims perform Hajj every year. Hajj comes just once a year. Out of 1.3 billion Muslims, only 2 or 3 million perform Hajj. So one should really be very keen and interested in performing Hajj once they have the means. It's an invitation from Allah the Almighty. And attendance is only by invitation. One would do their best. They would save enough for Hajj and leave behind for their family members. And uh, get ready. If Allah have invited them, uh, the journey will be easy and they will find it easy to perform Hajj. But those who have the means and they keep postponing, there is a great threat from Allah and His Messenger وسلم, lest they die in this case before performing Hajj and Umrah. Uh, you talked about the issue also of maturity. And I know that's going to raise some questions as well in terms of, I mean, first of all, what exactly counts as maturity? Um, but then also maybe families want to take their children, and there's a lot of issues that would come up in terms of the rulings. But uh, I guess let's just start with what counts as maturity. Well, uh, many ibadat rely on reaching the puberty age. And that in Islam is determined by, for a girl, by seeing her monthly period right away, 
she have reached the puberty age, where the prayer had, has become mandatory, where fasting has become mandatory, it's not optional anymore. Uh, same with the boys, whether boys or girls, upon seeing what's known as a wet dream, accompanied by uh, discharge, sexual discharge, in this case, that person have reached the puberty age. Hajj has become mandatory upon them if they do have the means, the financial means and the physical uh, means. There are other signs like reaching the age of 15 if they do not see any of the previous signs for a boy and a girl. If it happened that a person have taken his uh, children with him, boys or girls, at young age, is it okay? Would that Hajj count for them? It would count as a charity, as a voluntary Hajj. As a woman raised her baby child to the Prophet ﷺ, she said, Ali had a Hajj? He said, yes, and he would receive a reward for that as well. But the question now is whether their Hajj will be enough for the Ibadah, which is mandatory, or they still owe Allah another Hajj after reaching the puberty age. Once they've done so many Hajj before the puberty age, uh, these are all charities, voluntary ibadat. But after reaching the puberty age, they still owe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hajj, which is a mandatory ibadah. Well, one question that uh, this brings up to me when you, you talk about taking the children um, when they're young, uh, and then also I assume once they reach the puberty age, if, if someone's in the habit of doing this or planning to do this, does it count even though the child didn't uh, pay for it himself? And this, this comes up in, in other issues as well. Sometimes people might have a sponsorship or a grant or a gift of Hajj. Is this considered sort of cheating that you didn't save the money and, and spend it yourself? Or does this count as the obligatory Hajj? Not at all. Uh, I would be very happy if you sponsor me to perform <laughs> Hajj this year. Any person uh, who performs Hajj either out of his pocket, his savings, or a grant from somebody else, his Hajj is, uh, will accept it if he follows the same uh, uh, ceremonies and rites that the Prophet ﷺ explained. Uh, concerning the money, where the money is coming from, as long as the money is coming from a lawful source of income, it is perfectly okay, whether it's your money or somebody else's money. As a matter of fact, a person may borrow, he does not have to, he may borrow. If he knows that, over a period of time, he has the means of paying off the debt, but he does not have to, it's not obligatory upon him to borrow to perform Hajj. Well, there's also the issue of security. Um, of course, there's going to be any number of security concerns, probably naturally, in terms of traveling, there's always some uncertainty. Um, you know, we hear about some of the unfortunate events that occur at Hajj uh, sometimes when people are injured. So what, what is the limits and really the definition of what security means in terms of giving us the, the, the opportunity to perform Hajj? Well, really things have changed big time. We're talking about security in the past where the pilgrims used to travel on the back of the camels, mm -hmm. uh, being subject of uh, robberies, etc., but now with the uh, airborne, with the ships and, uh, you know, uh, ground transportations, it has become uh, very, very safe. And that's why when a person feels safe, then plus the means of performing Hajj, he or she must perform Hajj. And the other issue you mentioned was a mahram for women. Now, sometimes you'll hear women say, you know, I have everything for Hajj and I want to go, but I don't have a mahram. Uh, and they're worried that, you know, because they have the financial, physical capability, that this is going to be sinful for them if they don't go. So they try to find a way to go without the mahram. Can you talk a little bit more about the details of this requirement? First of all, what is the definition of a mahram? Uh, a mahram is a male member of the family of the woman who is either a father, a brother, a son, an uncle, a nephew, or of course a husband. Those people are not allowed to marry to this woman, and the husband is already married to her. So the permanent mahram, a person who can never marry to this woman, he is her mahram, he can travel with her, he can take her places, and she doesn't have to wear and cover uh, her head and face uh, before him. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated in one hadith narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him and, and his father, and the hadith is a very, very sound hadith. He said that it is not permissible for a woman to travel three days without a male mahram of her family. 
And in another hadith, Abdullah ibn Abbas, uh, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, also narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said that a man should not stay alone in one place, enclosed area, with a woman who's not his mahram. And a woman should not travel alone without having a mahram with her. So one of the companions uh, was there and he heard the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have been deployed to such and such battle. And my wife set out for Hajj. She's gone for Hajj this year. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Go and join your wife. So he changed his direction from going to a battlefield, which is very, very necessary, to the priority is to travel with your wife to give her company. People who watch on the screen the rites of Hajj in the crowd around the Kaaba while making tawaf, different areas where they have to spend the night in the streets, such as in Muzdalifa and in Mina and so forth, would definitely recognize the great need for a mahram with a woman. Sheikh, I'm really glad we were able to give uh, the viewers uh, and, of course, myself this great introduction to Hajj. Um, I think it's whet our appetite to learn more. And inshallah, when we come back on our next episode, we're going to go into more of the details of actually performing Hajj, inshallah, starting with the preparations before the journey. So please stay with us and tune in again to Hajj Step by Step. And we hope that this will be your authoritative guide for the act of Hajj, inshallah, this year. If not this year, then soon. Assalamu alaikum. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله Thank <laughs> you.